Carol Sanford with us. She's been doing work for uh, many decades um, on helping people to contemplate their assumptions. And uh, I think you're doing a lot of work with executives, helping them think about the structure of their business. And I do a lot with businesses top to bottom. I don't favor executives. Yes, beautiful. Well, that's a great uh, entree. So um, Carol had asked if we could have breakout sessions because we don't have the uh, capacity with this uh, seminar structure. We're going to be um, engaging you through me. So uh, you all through through me to Carol. Uh, she'll lay out the details, but um, looking forward to your presentation and, and we'll just let you uh, take it away, Carol. All right. I'm going to put my PowerPoint up here because it has some of the conversation that you and I had. Um, but let me talk a bit about what I'm gonna play with you with today and think of it that way. Don't think of me as bringing you some truth, but something to play with, to experiment with, to discover both at a personal level, at an organizational uh, level, but also in engagement with life systems which you work with everything from biota and its creative process and soil ultimately in food for all living things maybe even eventually in a service industry related to food or in habitat preparation related to it or even human habitat i'm not sure where you all come from but what i'm going to talk about today will help you think about everything from raising your children to growing your business, to having a, uh, an ecosystem and social systems that work better. So let me tell you a little bit about what Dan was talking about. I have a little more words on these because you and I can't interact. So I was planning on breakouts because of the following. The, read with me rather than get ahead of me. I believe that an epistemology, that is how people learn, how they know, has to be in alignment with the subject you're talking about. And here I'm going to talk about regeneration, which is, and I'm going to talk about it from a way I learned from my grandfather, and he learned from his great grandfather coming through the Iroquois Mohawk line. Now, obviously, you can tell by looking at me that I'm not full of that blood quantum anymore at all. But my grandfather was the first one off of a reservation. And so there was a richness there and none of it was run where somebody was an expert teaching the other. And that is what this format forces us to do, to work with a, uh, an epistemology, how we know, how we learn, uh, how we make sense of the world an epistemology that is inconsistent with the subject I'm about to work with you with. Um, what I believe in as an epistemology is a developmental one where you and I ideally would be in the same room or we would be in the same conversation. I'd be able to engage you back and forth, which I mostly do when I do these in a workshop mode. I found out an hour ago, I couldn't do that. so. I have created some, we're going to call them substitutions or ameliorations that will help you experience what I'm talking about. And that is called working with a split page listening process. All right, I'm going to tell you what that means. First, don't write in the chat room. Don't write in the question and answer uh, place. Ignore those. I will give you a point where I will ask you to put something in there, but I'm going to pay zero attention to the chat room and zero attention to the question uh, box, except at a certain point in time. Uh, and I've told Dan, ignore everything came before that because you weren't involved in the process I'm about to give you. So the split page, well, I'll give you that on the next slide. I would like for you, in addition to not writing in the chat room, not writing questions right now, to not trust me particularly. Don't accept anything that I say as truth. Don't assume I'm an expert. Don't assume I have it all figured out. Wish that were the case. But also don't reject anything I say. So the idea is I'm offering things for you to try out, try on your own life, in your own work, 
And when you leave here, you know, I'll never know what you did. So don't feel a need to debate me. Uh, you'll be wasting your time. So try it on. Don't accept it because I said it, which means don't take notes. Oh, this may drive you crazy. I'll show you in a minute. But I'm going to suggest a way you take notes. Um, I don't believe in traditional Q&A where you offer a question and I answer it. What I'm going to ask you to do, and Dan is going to be an intermediary for this, is when I tell you, not before, to offer a question, so you can be paying attention to your question, write the question, but write your own best answer. We can talk about that when we get there, why it's very important for other people to have their own best answer to that before they even hear someone else's idea. And for me to be able to learn something from either how you're thinking, how you work on it, how you applied it. So then we become a living interaction. This deadly webinar thing, which is going to drive me crazy. You're going to hear me complain a lot. Um, it, can, it can't let us work in a living way. I may give you some of my reflections or I may not. I very often don't ever answer questions because I don't feel like that's the very best way for either of us to learn. In my developmental communities where people join and stay with me for decades, we do a lot of engaging in a live process where I have some experience, you know, i am uh, been around a while, got a pretty good track record, so if you're in one of my communities, we can do this more live. What you're going to be working on, and I'll show you the uh, split page listening in just a second, is noticing that the inner work, that means what's going on in your mind, what's going on in your body, what's going on in, in um, um, your emotions, all of that's going to be just as important, maybe more important than the outer knowledge that you may be getting here. All right, so again, don't use the chat room, don't use the question box, except I am gonna pose you a question for you to reflect on. And the question, it'll be much more fun for me to ask you questions. All right, so what is this split page observation? Don't do this on the computer. And it's not because I'm a Luddite. It's because if you'll do what I'm gonna tell you on a piece of paper, you can get your whole brain working. And you'll see in a moment why holes are important. You're going to draw a line down the middle of the page. On one side, let's say the left-hand side, you're going to write any thoughts you have about applying what I said. If you can't stand it, you can write down a little what I said. But don't. I'm more interested in you writing how you're interacting. So you're going to listen and prepare to write. Oh, the other half of the page is what's going on in your, your um, uh, experience. What are you discovering? What's changing? You'll be noticing you. All right, as you do this split page, you're gonna come up with right now, given where you work in the world, some idea of a living system, a life shed. Now that's a word I made up. I'm actually pretty proud of it because watershed, air shed, uh, food shed, and there are a few other sheds I've heard of, are all anthropocentric labeling. That, oh, our water comes from there, let's call it the watershed, different group, okay? Our food comes from there, let's call it the food shed, et cetera. Life sheds to me have so many living dynamic interactions, human, non-human, and there's no such thing as a river, really. That's an artificial construct. It's really the hydrological process in a, in a life shed. Or you can think about a child. All right, a child, um, huh, well, we often think of children as good at some things, bad at others, they've got a few problems. And by the way, I'm not gonna teach you a better way to problem solve, although that said in the ad, you're gonna see, I'm gonna tell you to quit working on problems and start working on holes. But you are gonna pick something. It could be your child, uh, it could be, your neighborhood, and it's got to be a real neighborhood or it's not a whole. And I want you to watch your practice. So I want you to be applying, not debating me at all. That's a waste of both of our time. 
but you're going to be applying as we go on this piece of paper. And don't worry about if you get on the right side or wrong side. I mostly want you keeping separate your observation about what you're doing with what I offer from what you are doing and discovering. All right, here then you might ask from your own real experience, uh, which a webinar is a training, it's not a real experience. Um, I realized I didn't change this after Dan came and told me I couldn't put you in breakout. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to go to the bottom one. I assume the first two questions are really about you watching the content I'm bringing you, but what you're doing with it, which is a living regenerative process and what's going on with you. You might also notice what distracts you and how do you bring yourself back. Now you'll see as we go along why these are, are markers for regeneration. Regeneration is not something we do to land. Uh, and treat it in a way that uh, it makes everything healthier. I mean, that it is, but it's how we bring the life together. So sorry, I got a little off with all the ground rules changing in the last hour. All right, I am going to give you, share with you a framework that I, I gained through my grandfather. These are my words placed on it. They have an Iroquois, uh, origination, and I'm, I'm not going to go all the way back there, but the, the topic I have on the top of this page is very important as a way to look at how we end up thinking. I would say I work and write for well-intended people. They want to do the right thing, and they get something, but they get blinded by that they're doing something better than the bad guys. So we're working sustainably, and then there are those guys that are, are not. And when we polarize like that, we get blinded to the very best way we could go, the more effective, deeper, faster, which I call the way of living systems. I'm going to give you four paradigms. Think about for a moment what you know about people who work in each of these, including you. The, the lowest level, and what I mean by that is the least complete, the least encompassing, the least sense of a system, I, and we all work here, is the extract value paradigm. I need stuff, my family needs stuff, my company needs stuff. Uh, and so I set up to be able to take what I need. And that includes getting a job and getting paid for it. So I'm really asking for a value return. But if what I do is take more than my share, then I'm extracting value from people, from Mother Earth, and from the social system. So we end up with inequity. Now, we all feel bad about those things, but we don't think about them as a paradigm. This is a way we're seeing the world. And we call that bad people, right? And so therefore we're gonna be better than bad. That's the next level. In paradigm sense, we look at those people who are extracting value from others and we say, wait, we've got to stop that. We've got to do less harm. We have to slow down the extraction, less carbon, less water waste, less food waste. We have to stop the entropy. Uh, I call it a rest disorder, like stop that stuff. And we do it on behalf of and toward people, planet and social system. And what I mean by that is we act as a surrogate or as a voice for those things. And then we begin to think of ourselves, we're better than those bad people. And the real challenge is we can get so excited about how much better than we are at the bad. You might notice I have a little more room on this uh, slide to share some other ways we could actually maybe bring bigger change. And the next one up I call, well, let's don't just do less bad. Let's do good for others. This is where philanthropy comes in. This is where... Um, the idea of uh, giving back, uh, of sometimes being a mentor or coach, 
there's some real challenges at this level. And as I work with companies like Seventh Generation, Jeffrey Hollander, I'll tell you a story about him. He, he loves having stories told about him. Uh, when I first started working with them, they were trying to be a less bad products company, uh, personal care, household products, be less destructive to planet, to earth. And by the way, where we're at it, be uh, less bad to the people that work for us. And I said to them, well, that's a little like beating your children less. <laughs> and now I, I've said that for 25 years. I now hear other people saying, which is fine. And once Jeffrey saw that, he said, well, I want to do more than that. I want to do good. I said, okay, let's look at what good mean. And he gave me a list of what good meant. I said, do all the people you're asking to do that agree with your definition of good? And he thought for a moment, he said, I don't know. And I said, well, then how do you, what makes you think you have a right to do good? Do you look at philanthropy groups who go out or soil groups, by the way, I've sat in rooms with Monsanto. They believe they're doing good, right? For planet, for people who are gonna starve if they don't figure this out. People in a do good mindset, wherever they are can be dangerous because we end up colonizing, we end up imposing, we end up projecting, but we're sure we're the good guys. And this one seems even better as Jeffrey said, than doing less bad. The top level, which I can think at right now, is the idea of instead of trying to slow down the extract value, trying to do good, is to start with the question I asked Jeffrey. If you're thinking about a life shed, you would ask, what is this life shed's way of working? And it'll be different than the life shed next door or on the other side of the planet. It has its own way of working. That's why I call them life sheds or living. The process of working with something when it's alive is to understand it, understand what it's, uh, its way of working, how it works as a system, and then get involved in evolving its capacity to do that better, to be self-determining expressing its own uniqueness, its own essence with and by those uh, people, the living, all the living entities, including the people, and to have our whole work be supporting it gaining capacity. So I bet, I use this uh, little example a lot. Most people don't know what I'm talking about, but given who all of you are, I bet you know who Kat Anderson is in Tending the Wild. It's a beautiful book and it came from her dissertation work at Berkeley. Uh, and by the way, I was there also, didn't, didn't know her. But that work said the native uh, indigenous people didn't figure out what they should impose on the land. They watched it and they watched how the forest farmed. They watched how the people who lived there were in a reciprocity. And the entire process of that community of people was to support the capacity of that forest or farm or life shed to do the work that it was seeking to do. But that required a non-egoistic, non-heroic approach. This is a big shift. And we often have people get really stuck at the do good. Um, they've done what they can at the risk disorder. But when you step into a systemic mode, you have something powerful happening. And the well-intended among us, and I include me, I was raised in this culture. I really always want to do good. I want to give you guys something great. I want you to go away so excited and I've done something good for you. But I try not to design anything that imposes what I think or even encourage you to adopt my good. And you can see therefore why I don't like this format of I sit here and talk to you and you normally would take notes uh, and not observe your own thinking. I'm going to uh, pause for just a moment and ask you to stop and write, take your split page. And out of what I just said, what are your reflections on the left-hand side? What is it open for you? What does it give you an additional question? How does it, um, 
relate to how you were already thinking? What would you add to what I'm thinking? What am I adding to what you're thinking? Then also watch yourself. Notice, is there any part of you, I said a word and you wanted to debate me? Not a good use of anyone's time under any condition. Did you notice that you got excited and uh, were really starting to work on something that you're already working on? Think about your practices, the way you work, the way you write if you're a writer, the way you speak if you're speaking, the way you run your company. Where do you have some things at each of these levels? Write that on one or the other side. And I'm gonna pause for a moment and out of this, you can, don't put them in the chat or the question Q&A yet, but write what you're beginning to have a question about. You probably want to ask me, but we're going to do that differently. Or you want to ask somebody else. Just take a couple of moments. I'm actually not going to talk here for about 30 seconds and ask you to write because then you're engaged in the right epistemology. All right. Couple more seconds. This also lets us rest a little. All right, now I'm going to show you what I learned specifically from my grandfather, which I said earlier, uh, and how it works to go from the bottom to the top, and this really should be drawn more than in concentric rings, because when you get to the top of this or the outer ring of evolving capacity, you now can go do good because you can work on what they're seeking to evolve, what they need and what they're gonna do with it. And you can go to helping them work on how, how they can do less of the harm they wanna stop doing and are coming to see is important and to help them find what the reciprocity is rather than the transactional nature. So don't think about what I gave you. I have to put it that way to get our mind to see it. Same is gonna be true here. I'm gonna give you a continuum of things which are like taking that and turning on, on its side. And I'm gonna um, use the concept of quantum using David Bohm's way of thinking, which I worked with, um, well, a very long time, 60 years, I worked with David Bohm's ideas because he had been at Berkeley before I was there. And as I took physics, I was working with his students who were directly descended from him. It shook up my world. He and Thomas Kuhn, Kuhn was there also, Structured Scientific Revolution. And I got to work on the idea of paradigms, which changed my life. So. I, that's my source, so you know what I'm drawing on. I'm not a physicist, uh, but I'm very interested in this, the uh, um, epistemology of science and the cosmology of science. All right, here is how we're gonna work. So notice over here on the left-hand side, I have extract value. On the right-hand side, I have evolved self-determining capacity. So you know where we are. And in the middle, I have kind of what we, you saw on the in-between, but mostly I'm going to show you the two ends. The left side, I'm going to equate with the way we have been taught in school with classical physics, with the old guy, uh, Newton, who uh, Einstein says that the Newtonian method is a billiard ball model of how science works. That is, you get a cue stick and you go hit something, you pick what you're gonna hit and you pick a pocket you're gonna put it in over there and your cue has decided where you're going and who you're gonna move and how, and you get them in the pocket. Think about in school, when you were in school, you had a teacher who saw themselves as the cue stick, I bet you, maybe, you were one of those rare lucky people, or you maybe were like me and you had to fight that system because I wasn't very good at submitting to the cue stick. 
In school, you also were told what to learn. Here's the cue ball. And often your parents augmented that. And then there was a place they wanted you to go and they gave you a test so they could tell whether you got there. We have designed all of life like that. If you are an employee in a company, you're constantly being hit with a cue stick. You are the cue ball and they got a pocket they're taking you for. But you also do that to other people. We, you, like me, are grow up in this environment very conditioned to the billiard ball model of life. It includes incentives, rewards, recognition, saying to people, including our kids, good job, or uh, trying to change the incentives. We're so conditioned in that model. On the right-hand side, David Bohm and the idea of quantum is everything is happening at one time. There's no cue stick there, there. And whatever is going on that has a thingness to it is pushing back against the cue stick. And you don't have to follow the rules of if you don't hit it, it can't move and it will stop because that's not true of, of most of life. It's a construct we're so sold on, we can't see the interactive nature of living systems and the nested nature they have. So watch for that. That's what I'm doing here. And I will halfway through pause uh, so you can absorb a little because this is dense, right? And that's the other problem with this format. I love to then talk to you for a moment about what I just said, find out what you're doing and uh, at least write it down for yourself. All right. Seven first principles is what I call these of living systems or regeneration. On the left hand side, the first principle, I'm going to start on the right hand side. On the right hand side, the first principle is you can't work with something and call it living systems if you aren't working with a whole. So when I said life shed earlier, life shed is a way of saying that's a whole. And if there's a wetlands or there's a farm on it, they're, they're the, certainly the farm is not a hole. It has a, a place that it occupies that is either interfering with or supporting that life shed working and supporting animals. And we know they are trying to track and uh, hunt and do what they need to do. We don't start out with the whole, the whole child, the whole neighborhood, the whole life shed. Instead, what we do because Mr. Newton told us to is we fragment, we reduce, and then almost everybody since then. We chop up a life shed into its water, its soil, its forest, its animals, its insects, uh, as though they are not a living whole. And those well-intended people who keep trying to make it a little better so well, think about it as a process. Think about them as related. Think about them as connected. The water, the, the animals, the fish, and the bears, and they create stories about how they're all related. And the minute we do that, we're trying to do better than the Newtonian model of the reductionist in which people can easily move in to extracting value because everything else is an externality. This is the I believe, paradigm that is undermining our ability to have a climate system that works, a planet that's healthy, to have societies that work, democracies that work, uh, equity and justice, racism, all of them come from starting here, that we're not working with a whole, we're working with a fragment. Think for a moment what you do that unintentionally, certainly not for ill, I'm sure, fragment. Do you have lists of things that you work from that really are trying to get it down to something simple? Rather than build the mind, which can see the whole, because that's the excuse. School systems are the worst places happens. I mean, first we divide kids up by years and we judge them against each other, which is the next category. And then we find that this child is uh, slow in math, so we put them in a remedial class and they get slower. Uh, and we find this child is uh, very good at music, but they can't read and write, and we assume something's wrong with them. And so we fragment them as a child, we fragment the school system, and pretty soon we're dissecting frogs and trying to study them all uh, broken up. 
once we've done this, and at the end of today, I'm going to come back and show you how this is a cascading mess. The minute we aren't working with holes and we're working on fragments, everything is artificial. There's nothing real. And so the next thing we do, and I'm going to stay on the left hand side right now, is we put everything in categories. You can go all the way back to Samaria and find some categorizing. You can certainly find it in ancient Greece when you got to Aristotle. Uh, he was the master at dissecting and creating categories and lumping things based on their surface look. Same thing with kids. There's the high performers, the low performers, kind of the middle, the ABC student. They're all in categories. We do it with humans too, where we put them in a typology. Oh, let's pull out something that says there's one of four types and put everybody in a box. We do the same thing with a quote watershed. There are five types of watersheds. Did you know that? And they have these similar characteristics. So there's looking at the legs of a frog. Now, once we've done that, we have to get names for these categories and we have to get descriptions for them. And so everything becomes generic. And people say to me all the time, but wait, there's so much data. You have to have massive computers to manage it. No, you don't. Actually, um, it's not even the right way to go about it because now we're working on the surface. So what do you do instead, people say? You learn to see an idea which is so foreign that some of you will choke when I say it, which is you learn to see essence, which means the working of something as a whole. I do essence with the company when I first get there. And it's, it comes through the founder. I've done it with DuPont all the way back to E.I. DuPont, the founder, and it changed how they manage things. Seventh generation, we did it with Jeffrey also. Jeffrey's essence has to do with uh, uh, exposing uh, dissonance. People say one thing and they do another. He can't stand that. And so he will create, he will go demonstrate, get arrested, all to try and get someone to see what a group is doing. He has, it's like he can't not be that. And if you took that away from him, he would not be Jeffrey. He also is determined to create social justice. It's innate in him. In that he will uh, give away his shirt. He'll give, his whole original ideas were all do good. But over time, he's come to see that every whole has an essence. Um, my, one, one of the core aspects, which you will be able to see in me, so I'll share with you, is disrupt certainty. I have done that since I could talk. And my father put me in closets and locked them for hours to shut me up because I didn't believe that his racist views made any sense. I knew the Mexican farm workers, I knew the kids, I knew all of them, but I wasn't internalizing the messages I was given. I kept contradicting them and disrupting them. So you get punished if you get over on the right-hand side here. And many of you may have gotten punished. So I do work early with finding the essence of the company, helping them design work systems that everyone can bring their essence to the overall strategy. Uh, and ultimately, I end up doing it with many of my community members, not because I'm some uh, high wisdom figure. I've just learned to see something different than anyone can learn. It takes a little time. But think about, I often, I'll give you an exercise you can do. Think about when you were a child. Think about an experience or an event or uh, might have lasted over a period of time that you would say, just like I did with getting put in the closet, what did that say about who I am now? I can, there's, your essence is gonna be in there. And I, it takes a bit of work and it's very hard to do it for yourself, but you can feel that if you will say, what is one of my favorite stories when I was a child that speaks to who I am now? Now you got a bit of a feeling for what it means to work on essence versus, we can give you a test for what type you are. And then you would be one of four or one of nine, one of nine minus some others. 
and you would know who you were. You would know who your personality is. You also are being put in categories by everyone. And by the way, you're putting people in categories and I am too. It, if you grew up in a Western worldview, you learn categories and you then make people generic by their skin color, by their way of expressing themselves by, um, well, the list goes on and on. So once you have fragmented and you don't have holes, you don't have a child who's a hole, I'm going to keep using that one because it's easy to hang on to, but it is true of an entire corporation. It's true of uh, any living system, including this planet probably has an essence and it's different than the essence of another planet. But once you've done fragmented, once you've done categorizing, made things generic, now you see variances from the generic category. So it said in my little write-up, I was going to show you a new problem-solving way. I, I don't know where that came from. I didn't write it. I'm going to show you how problems all come from categories. They come from variances of people, processes, systems not fitting the category. And we got to get the category back. And then what we do is behave in a way we generate issues. Please don't learn better problem-solving. That's a Western worldview that came out of the Vienna circle about how we're gonna do research. And I've done a couple of podcasts on why quote research is deadly at categorizing reductionists uh, and then generating what the issue is. All the problems we make out of children for they're about their illnesses, all the problem we make about employees. And in fact, most of the things we do about living systems, animals or um, a, a way we farm, all of them come from fragmented reductionists. They're put into categories and now there are variances. There couldn't even be variances if you work from essence because essence is singular. It's one of one. It is never duplicated. Nature never duplicates. But we don't learn to see that and see it working. Instead, we try and figure out what category people are in. Then we look at their variants and we've got problems. If you stay with this, this way of thinking on the left-hand side, you begin to think people are predetermined. They're fixed. Can't do anything with them. Well, maybe a few can grow them. You put in the middle. Yeah, some people can grow. There's a whole book written about how uh, you can give people other experiences, opportunities, and you can grow them. Development is when you help reveal essence, see the potential that comes from that essence. So if you've got children or you were a child, you were different than your siblings or your cousins or the kids you played with. And if people could see that essence and they didn't try and sell you on a career that might be built on quote your strengths. So what we're wanting to learn to do is see a whole that has an essence. And learning to do that is a skill we don't build. We are used to building skills in the science lab to chop up the frog and, and label its various parts. Once I can see your essence, I can see potential. Now I can de develop that potential and grow you. And Jeffrey Holler said that was the best thing ever happened to him. All right, I am gonna pause now and here's what I'm gonna ask. I'm going to ask you to first in the chat room, everybody, to put what's going on with you on your split page. I want you to write and say, here's what I'm thinking. I'm, uh, here's what's going on. Here's what's getting shaken up. Here's what is getting disrupted. Here's what I'm adding into my own thinking. Here's how I'm putting it to work. Plus, make any comments on how you notice you're trying to engage. What, What's driving you? Again, the debate is the biggest one where people will try and do. Um, but are you finding yourself um, able to observe yourself and what's going on? So make some notes in the chat room. And I'm going to give Dan a moment to keep watching those. Uh, but and, and he may share a few with us. But if you are starting to form a question, which probably many of you are by now. Here's your assignment if you'd like to talk, watch Dan and I talk about it. Unfortunately, I can't have you talk with me, which is what I really like to do. But 
pose in the Q&A box your question. But immediately before you hit return, put your own best answer. That's the way you grow yourself and you grow your ability to work developmentally in living systems way. So pose that question, your own best answer. And then here's what Dan's going to do. And he didn't know he was going to do this until an hour ago. So uh, I, I really appreciate him stepping up and being a surrogate for you and your question. He's then going to give his own best answer to that question. And I'm going to then engage with Dan around your question, your answer, his answer, and come back and use what we just learned. So I can see that the, um, I'm not good at tracking chat boxes. There's quite a bit in the chat box. Um, but so those of you who keep working on chat, maybe Dan can share a few of those. And we're going to stop and see what kind of questions we get. I don't know where the question box is. You know where that is, Dan, don't you? Uh, the Q&A box is as, as the chat box on the bottom of the screen. People can click on it and open it up. Okay. I'm not seeing anything come in yet. Okay, well, maybe people are actually doing their own good work, so that's great. Uh, what do you see in the chat room that interests you? Uh, all I'm seeing was just a, a, a thing we went back and forth on with, oh, here comes, here comes something. Um, Uh, Bill here uh, says, um, <clears throat> my scientific training was on the left. I wanted to get to the right via Buddhism, meditation, questioning, reductionism, and left grad school in disgust, finally moving to farming, but still applying my scientific training to it. This is disrupting that. That feels well, like. Well, okay, this is disrupting that. What, what's your experience with that, Dan? I don't know what you do in the world, but what are you experiencing relative to what Bill said? Um, well, I would say that that was certainly my um, path as a farmer um, was, you know, applying a series of practices that I was taught um, and sort of just assumed they were. Um, and then when I started to question because it seemed like things weren't doing as well as I could, uh, I was forced. Well, I would, you know, my path brought me to understanding that it's all one <laughs> integrated ecosystem, that it's the living system. And only when you work to support life um should you expect it to flourish so that was a and then did you have a place you could go learn about that how did you go learn about the living systems way of growing um personally i found the acres usa uh community conference and books um and elders and attended seminars and and read books and practiced on the farm um but so you yeah. went to an alternative path and found folks who were like me, got shut in closets probably, right? And like <laughs> you, who may not have even done well in school because we couldn't pass the test, right? Yeah. Yeah. I All always right. ask the question, why? You're talking about essence. And I was like, my essence is to ask the question, why? <laughs> that was the thing that- and Actually, that's a practice of your essence. That's not, that's a doing. Okay. Essence is more about your being. Okay. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't teach people how to do that in any kind of forum like this. But we work on it in my communities. Look once more and see if you have any questions coming in or any other reflection. Then I'll go back and finish my other three parts of this. And then by then, now you all can start adding questions as we go. But add your own best answer as you do. And try not to do too much in the chat room for a little while after we stop here, because uh, it leaves you not looking at what's happening to you. All right, Dan, anything you want to add back into this conversation yet? Um, I see questions that people have posed, but not answered their own best answer. Oh, no, we don't talk to you if you don't give your own best answer. That's <laughs> the wrong epistemology. That makes me an expert. Uh, and the, I don't a, believe in that. Yeah, it's a, it's a key point you said that, you know, you'd like people to give their questions, but also to give their best answers. And yeah. then we can engage from that point. Yeah. In limited electronic framework framework. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So is that all we have for right now? Uh, there's a bunch of uh, look, look like very thoughtful uh, comments in the chat room. Um, we'll and, share and a few. I think that will 
it builds more spirit to have yeah. us engaging. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, Lenore, I am delighted because this is the way I love to see and so fun to hear it in this context professionally as a, homatic, as a holistic somatic pain therapist, personally in being in relationship with myself, with the whole. Uh, I'm feeling validated to pause before I approach messaging around my environmental activism work and find ways to respectfully listen more. Um, and I bet you there are a lot of people who are relating to that. Yeah. yeah. All right, uh, find um, one more and then we'll go back and add a little more, build a little on this and then come back to another set of questions. Um, let me see. Uh, from Joel, um, <clears throat> how does someone learn to view someone's essence? It seems to me that in order to see essences, you must first learn to love the thing, person, system that you are viewing. Yeah. The fragmented reductionist system seems to be selfishly applying your own agenda yeah. on someone or something. Yeah, I don't know that. I can even, what would you add to that? Or what, how do you relate to that question and his own best answer, Joel? Um, well, I guess, you know, my personal process, the, um, the answer to the question why was love and so i go right i think it's really you know loving the land is as you were saying earlier in my sort of question about what i'm what's the hole that i'm envisioning to you know in this process with the split screen um it's i love i mean i i get really great fulfillment by, by going to various pieces of the property and just sitting there yeah. at all hours of the day and all months of the year um, and just sensing. And yeah, I do feel like that process, you know, in the middle of the winter at night, you see things from a certain vantage point that you wouldn't see in the spring yeah. in the yeah, afternoon. Exactly. Um, so. Well, I'm going to give Joel an additional exercise because I, I say it slightly differently than he did. I say you have to care enough to want to evolve their capacity. And for them to be able to express their essence, you have to care so much that, and that is love. I mean, caritas is one of the words for love, which means caring, but not take care of. It means give capability for them to act. And one exercise that I give folks in my group to do what you were just talking about, go, you can go in nature or you can go in a group of children or you can go in a place there's any kind of spirit that you wanna feel its essence. And I ask the question, what is energizing that? And how is it energizing me? Because you're really reading energies when you look at essence, but you're not reading them in a, um, a new age way. You're reading them by the experience of being in the same field with them. In your case, the literal field, but it is being, um, I often sit when I'm doing an essence reveal with a person and I sit and watch what's happening to me because it means I'm allowing there to be us to be one whole temporarily. And in that I can get feelings for, and I don't ever tell people here, I'm right. I say, here's what I'm feeling. Here's what I'm seeing. And then we do a little playing with it. Essence is a lot of work, but boy, it is a great place to start, as Joel said, is you can't do that with something, someone you don't love. And you said it too. Yeah. All right, I, I'm going to go back and- I, uh, good, I, I, I scrolled down on the Q&A. I didn't see, and there are some good ones. Can I just do one quick one here from Grace? Yes, please. Looks like a really good question and answer. Um, and there's a couple more here I didn't see before. I'm sorry. Um, uh, expanding to think about the whole seems an infinite project. How can we see the whole of all possible realities while maintaining our ability to engage on our human scale? That's her question, uh, or their question, sorry. Um, answer, seeing each segment as a whole and as parts of a greater whole allows us to engage in self-development. So you got a comment on that? Yeah, I would say, I, I mean, I think perhaps a bit to your point just, just before, um, I feel like uh, I am an individuated, you know, piece of the whole. And the thing that I need to be focusing on at any given moment is the thing that's I'm perceiving with my individ individuated 
self. And so, you know, if there's something that I is beyond my context or outside of, it's like a, it's simply a concept in my mind. I can say, well, I can't affect that. So I'm just going to turn my attention to what's in my immediate vicinity. Um, but that's what comes to me. Okay. Um, I mean, I love all these. I love that question. I love the reflection. I love your reflection. Um, from my experience, and again, this isn't gospel. I'm not an expert. I'm still in life discovering all this. I don't try and conceive. I did in my Buddhist days where I would try and conceive of the all. It was the way it was presented to me, the all as a whole. Uh, because we've been so indoctrinated, as uh, Bill, I think, said, on the left-hand side, it's really hard to make that shift. So I say to people, and that we're really looking in, my next line down here will be at nested holes. You can't see one hole, you, and you're not a piece of something, you're embedded in something. Uh, you can't see that unless you can see that nested embeddedness. But it really, uh, people do learn eventually to see their child as a whole, not as a passel of strengths and weaknesses and grade level and performance and all that kind of stuff by really looking at what that child is aspiring to. In the case of the forest, what is that forest aspiring to? Because it has a life, it, 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 we don't speak its language. Uh, it probably does speak ours, but we can't hear real well. But the whole, the idea of seeing a whole is seeing something in context. Um, it's really important to avoid this middle column though, because they're kind of like ameliorations to me. We try and get things to relate or we try and get some ideals. There's a guy named John Mohawk wrote, uh, what's his book? Utopian Legacy of how that lost for us uh, in indigenous people were wiped out pretty much by ideals that were imposed from the, the Europeans. And the idea of growth is always wrapped around uh, some people will grow and not others. So what I'm working on here is showing the relationship between these as a way to understand a whole and a living system. Uh, oops, I didn't mean to click on the chat room. How do I get rid of that? Okay. Um, the next one down on the right-hand side is I learned it from my grandfather and I should tell you some of the stories about him. They're in my latest book, uh, The Regenerative of Life, a lot of stories about my grandfather and how I got connected with these principles. Um, nested and worlds, there are different levels which I talked about, which we don't see here. We end up over on my left-hand side, aggregating approaches. So. I will see people who have on their Twitter profile or LinkedIn or Medium, they'll say, I do sustainability, circular and regeneration. I thought, okay, you're aggregating without actually understanding what paradigm any of those are in. They're not the same thing. They don't have the same power. And sustainability and circular are accommodations for those extract value people, the arrest disorder. And I'm not gonna tell anybody to stop doing them because right now it's about all we've got. But if we don't go to a place, so if you're gonna do work in a city or a life shed, which a city sits in, you have to understand the essence of that city, the essence of the life that's there in a nested system. What role does this particular entity, and you can't even say person in a city or a neighborhood, but particularly if you've got a schoolyard piece of land, that land is a part of a, a life shed. And we have to ask why, what is its work? So nestedness is really learning to see the working of that dynamic and, and several people who offered something, including you, Dan, are speaking to this nestedness. I think it may be one of the concepts the well-intended understand better than anything else. By the way, I don't mean derogatively on well-intended. I just think that me included, 
get caught up in the doing good and the uh, arresting disorder and don't quite get all the way to how a living system works. Even when you're a farmer, and I grew up, my father was a farmer, not, not one you would have loved, but he was a farmer and I did a lot of taking care of cows and picking cotton and wheat and driving combines. I know that world, um, but most of it is not related to seeing it as nested in a life shed. Uh, and the other end of it is we end up doing an aggregation of anything as I call it, I say, if it's not bad, it's good. And we put it all in our bucket and try and do all of those things rather than becoming discerning. The amelioration or accommodation between those is we say, well, you have to get better integrated and more inclusive, but that doesn't take us to a whole debating whether to add a little more here. I think I'm going to stop uh, and give you the last of these so that we can get a few more questions from Dan and his reflection. But I want to give you these last two here. So if you can work with the whole, if you can start with the whole, you can see its essence. Just follow me here on the right hand side. Once, you, If you've got a child, you see it as a whole and understand it has an essence. You know now it has potential that is not generic but it is specific to this child. So on the right-hand side, you're always specific to a place, to a person, to uh, um, uh, an organization. And you wanna work on development of that potential for that essence to be expressed by that whole. One of the ways you can really move and help them, and if you're in an educator role or uh, an earth tender role, is to keep asking how it's nested. And then I say, once you understand it's nested, you don't want to do generic practices. I always ask myself, don't always get a good answer, but work on what's nodal here. This is the acupuncture idea. The Western medicine, you go dissect the parts, figure out which one is broken, what you're going to give for medication or surgery to fix it, and you try and fix them one at a time. Nodal would say, wait a minute, what are the energies that got this being to where they are? And when I go see my acupuncturist who I like, she's a Japanese, practice, uh, practice Japanese acupuncture. Um, I'm always amazed that she can feel the energy in my body. She didn't say, tell me what, what hurts, my MD does. But she says, ah, I can feel this meridian or this triple warmer or whatever it is, the one thing I need to do and then you need to do is this and it will start to shift the energy. So nodal is, I think it's related to like keystone species and other things that are like learning to see. In fact, essence is a nodal idea. Instead, what we do is we get a practice like on the left-hand side, uh, an approach and then we try and figure out, how, we get addicted to it. So we try and figure out how to sell it, to scale it. One of my dear friends at Harvard Business School um, who has written continuously about my work, my work in case studies, still can't get, doesn't like my answer. She says, Carol, the work you do is so amazing. You're do, working with these big corporations. Aspects of it are really changing. Things are moving and working. I tell your stories all the time, but you can't scale it. I mean, you got to figure out how to scale it. I said, yeah, I know that's, that's a Newtonian view. If something's good, scale it or leverage it. No, actually you need very little. You need to be able to just, uh, I know, I believe you can think I'm crazy that every day that I can practice consciousness, I can bring myself to a conscious state and that's a discussion for another day. I know that the energy I'm generating is serving more than me. And I know that if a bunch of us could get conscious about how living systems works, even if we didn't spread it to everyone, it begins to change things. I mean, there are numbers, everything from 2% to 25% for change. But I think if I look at acupuncture, acupuncture it's amazing how you can do very few things and you can move the whole and scaling it isn't needed. 
The last thing we have to do is understand everything needs a field to develop in. And a field is an energy field. It's an indirect way of working. The other thing about the billiard model is the cue stick, the cue ball, and the pocket. It's direct. And you got to you got to impact it directly. Where the quantum view is that everything's in the field and something moves on this side, it moves the other side. You know, the Heisenberg principle and uh, the Schroeder's cat. All of those things we know are true. And yet we all think that somehow on most days, me too, that we have to do it directly. And the whole idea of impact investing to me is dangerous. Impact anything is dangerous because it's like our first reflection where if I have an idea, I'm going to project it that you should be there and that I'm then going to help you be like I think you should be. So direct and impact are always left-hand side to me. Learning to build a field, and one of the reasons I don't like this format is I can't build a field with you. So I try at the beginning by being very disruptive. So you're going, what's she doing? This, this doesn't look like normal. Oh, that's kind of fun. Oh, that's weird. That whole process is a destabilizing process. And it's not a game with me. It's an opportunity to really work on discovery. Uh, and you, but you have to create a way where people are reflecting, where people are off center. And I do that in all my communities. Every time people come together, and for the last year we've been only online, we open with a process which will generate an energy field related to what we're about to work on. I'm not talking about meditation or breathing. I'm talking about reflection that is preparing our mind for the subject. And again, I tried to do a little bit of that today. All right, we are now at the top of the hour. We have about 27 minutes left and I have one more slide I wanna share with you. But Dan, I wanna go back to you and find out what's intriguing you I'm sure you've been kind of watching and tracking. Tell me what's either coming up in questions or reflections that you're willing to build on. Uh, sure. Um, <clears throat> well, <laughs> beyond uh, other people's reflections and questions and answers, um, I'm. Uh, I think I would. I'm not sure whose point it was earlier, but just um, I do feel like this is a a, a logical framing for something that I've intuitively been been tracking and it's a nice uh, I just I, I'm appreciating I'm appreciating um, the insight that is um, <clears throat> I don't know <laughs> yeah, you would have loved my grandfather I think I'm, 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 I'm experiencing a, a affirmation and, and uh, <laughs> so. yeah well I'm happy to do that I often give people language and frameworks for things they knew in their heart, but they couldn't explain it to anyone else because it just was. So that's, yeah, that's happy to do that. All yeah. right, how about some other folks? What are you seeing in there that intrigues Yeah, I've got a couple here uh, ready. Uh, Autumn Almanza has a, a question and, a, and an answer. Um, um, we humans are layered with our own unique complexities and we have our own ideas about the importance of the systems we live in. How can we work with others to create a, a more whole life shed when so often even what we think of is objective reality is colored by our subjective, often reductionist thinking and experience. Um, and her answer, or Autumn, I'm assuming it's a woman, I'm not sure, uh, their answer, I personally think that we lead by example and attract others toward our outlook and practice. As a teacher, I try to model wholeness, but the system I work in is not easy to work with. What do you think about that? And I'm actually going to give my own reflection on this one, but I want to hear yours first. Yeah, uh, one of the other um, things that was stimulated in, in me earlier was that it all feels very Taoist. Um, hmm. It's it's essentially the flow. And I think that's really the field and the nodes and everything else is just sensing the flow, you know, and, and engaging it. And so, um, yeah, I think, you know, they say don't talk uh, politics and religion in, you know, polite company. You know, <laughs> I don't think you need to frame it in that kind of a way. If I, it's, it's the, you know, actions speak louder than words, walk your talk, um, be sensitive and receptive, which I think is what Autumn's trying to say. But I would. Yeah, let me tell you what I think. Please. I disagree with you, Autumn. <laughs> 
and I was waiting to have something I could disagree with. But let me tell you what. Yeah. The idea of role modeling is a behavioral idea. It comes out of that we can't create who we are. We have to model ourselves off of others. And therefore, we have to be graded by others. We have to stand for something. I say, please don't let me be a role model for you. Oh, my God. That means your essence is not tapped. It means you are not creating your own plan. It means you're looking outside of you. And it means I think I am doing it right now. I want other people to copy me. Now, Autumn, I can hear you right here saying, no, 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 that's not what I meant. What I meant. <laughs> on average, people who think about role modeling are thinking, and I say, this is the best strategy of my well-intended. I work with Numi T, uh, with um, Seventh Generation, I mentioned Google, and all of them have this in their write-up when I first met them. And I, they want to role model how to get other companies, other farms, other architects, whoever they are working with me, they're going to model. And I said, oh, you're perfect. Huh? You got the answer. Ah, you're at the do good level. You're at the process of projecting onto others. Now, I am sure that it would be a lot more fun if Autumn and I could talk and I could find out what she's thinking, what she meant. We can't because... Well, we can't, the format doesn't let us. But I wanted to give you at least my reflection. And in my book, The Regenerative Business, there's a chapter five and its title is 30 Toxic Practices. And they m come out of the machine era where we have Newtonian ideas, which were hierarchies and delegation come from. They come out of the behavioral area, John Watson studying rats and imposing it. And all of that is about rewards, recognition, role modeling, uh, performance reviews, all of it's based on coming from outside of us. Uh, they come from the humanistic view, which is where the do good comes from. We got to save those savages from themselves. Uh, and then uh, the other thing is that the typologies and splitting people up into categories came from the humanists. I encourage you all, you can download that chapter for free. You do have to give me your email, but I don't misuse it. I put you in my newsletter list, and of course you can unsubscribe. But on my website, carolsanford.com, is a free chapter of the regenerative business. You can also get one of the regenerative life, responsible business, no more feedback, uh, the responsible entrepreneur, all of those have free chapters. And role modeling is one of those. So sorry, Autumn, but thank you for giving me something I could play with. <laughs> one more, and then I'm going to give you kind of a closing here. Yeah, um, uh, Phi Purna. Um, so a definition of good is based on childhood. Uh, we have right to, to do good and right to do bad and right to be. If paradigms must shift, won't what we believe has value become valueless? because with change of paradigm comes change of priorities mm. to observe before interactions or extraction. The only thing we can do is be, how can we live, get all of our needs met and be, maybe we don't, maybe we think we need things we actually don't. That must be indoctrination. How do we find, discover what we actually need? <laughs> Serious what? philosophical what? questions, explore outside of indoctrination, resisting authority, tradition and try on your wildness. I think that was the question section. Um, yeah. And and the and the answer, the best answer is see things as a whole, as a human race, whole as a mammal group, whole as nature, all different categories of whole we can look through. Uh, are there essences of categories, or is that only through indoctrinated conception? There is living language, living systems, living beings, and always evolve. So. Yeah. A very uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of philosophy in there, and I would love again to be in that conversation. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let me let me add just one word on one piece of uh, her reflection, which is I don't believe you shift paradigms. Uh, yeah. That was something that Thomas Kuhn said and got me excited at the beginning. I believe I live in multiple paradigms out of my awareness. I mean, and that only the real work is to become conscious 
of which I'm thinking through, which worldview, which is a whole different set of things, which paradigm I'm in, and can I be choiceful and understand the implications? Because if there is some external, as she says, idea that we're going to impose a paradigm shift, then we're back to the external. And I'm certainly not a fan of that. All right, let me do one last little closure here. Dan, Great. I'm going to thank you for helping on this. It's been a lot more fun than if I talk nonstop. Yeah, I'm having a great time. <laughs> uh, good. I want to look a little bit at how the degenerative process gets into our lives so deeply. Here's my, I'm, I'm working on a book, a new book, which will be out this summer, which is about these seven first principles and how they rule us. And if we're on the left-hand side, where we start is a fragment, where we work on issues, problems, externalities. And the minute we're fragmented, we have to categorize. And categorization comes from anything that's not a whole. And I don't think there are categories of holes. The very way I'm talking about it, at least, is uh, a natural system define, defines a whole. It has its own structure system process. It doesn't need to import. Uh, it doesn't need to have imported into it anything. It goes from a closed system to an open system, to a living system. So once we fragment and we categorize, we then create generic uh, answers for, do you fit in this category? Uh, some are more ideal than others, some have variances, and then we fix it. We, we decided, all right, everything's in categories, it's now fixed, we know who is in the band of normal. We design our entire organization, so if you've ever had a job somewhere, you were put in a box at some point, and there were structures, systems, and processes that kept you there, feedback. I'm, one of my books is No More Feedback, because it is the worst version of all of this stuff where we get people fixed and we squash the self. We squash their own ability to be conscious and self-expressing and essence expressing. And we compare people to standards and one another. You can feel the weight of this degeneration as it goes. And then we aggregate all the good stuff compared to the bad stuff. And we try and scale it and sell it. And the consulting industry, I gave, I tried for about three years to be a consultant and realized I didn't believe in it. What I was very interested in is people not, me not proselytizing, me not sharing best practices or certifying you so I can make money off of your certification. It was the ability to work on that right-hand side. The real problem is we get to the bottom then and we think we've got the answers. We're mechanical about our answers. We don't get disrupted. We don't re-examine whether what we call the, uh, the working of planet is really being served by our practices. We don't question. Uh, and we kind of lump together things uh, into projects and programs and prescribed views. And that's where we are right now. So life is exhausting. Um, what I would love to have you do is take that opening exercise I gave you where you had a split page and you're really looking at this and ask you, would you at this point, please talk about what you would like to do next with this? What, what's intriguing you? Where are you taking it off to work? And then um, maybe something more like, uh, what, what is this opening up for you? Uh, and anything you observe about yourself. I'm going to ask you at this point in the chat room to start adding what you're taking away from today. But I want you to start with what it's doing for you. And let's just fill up the chat room and we'll have Dan at the very end read a few of these. And we might engage with a few more. But I, while you're doing that writing in the chat room, I'm, we're not going to do any more Q&A, although can you save this chat room? I hope Dan or Chris and uh, can yes. we save it? Yes, I believe. Let's we'll figure out a way to post it or. Yeah. Yeah. All cool. right. So great. Here, I want to tell you one other thing about how you can get more free stuff from what I do to build on today. But I, I want you to keep writing so uh, Dan can be looking at what we're going to share. If you would like 
to have some more opportunity to engage with the kind of exercises I designed, I did um, free, what I called morning meetings. The day we were locked down, I said, we've got to do something because this is so much uncertainty, so much disruption. So free for 27 days, mornings in a row. I got online for 30 minutes and worked through how it is you use uncertainty and disruption to create transformation, how to have it work for you and gave people 55 exercises. You can go to Facebook and all you do is ask to join on the Regenerative Life Communities group, but don't go away because I don't ever go look at Facebook and certainly not that um, page. If you ask to join, it will give the opportunity to answer three questions. If you answer them, you're in and you've got, oh, I don't know, you got more hours. I've got people who use them now as a morning preparation a group in my uh, developmental communities, there are people who get up one to four times a week and work those, talk about them. Um, you can, cannot find a link to that anywhere. It's not on my website. So you have to go to Facebook. If you're having trouble and can't get to Facebook or don't like Facebook, we do have one other option. You can email me and I put it up here, carol at carolstanford.com and my business partner is my daughter. She knows how to help you get there and get it if you can't do Facebook. But we prefer that because it takes a lot of our time to get you set up another way. You can go look at my website. I run a podcast, which does a lot of disrupting on uh, research and why you can't trust people just to say, this is based on research. You want to ask, what paradigm was your research done from? What were the assumptions that were in it? I write a lot on Medium. Uh, I have a magazine that groups out of my community. We've got about 30 of us. We're a little slow, but we write about a regenerative view of ec economics, of parenting, of earth tending, of educating, of media content creation. Uh, and of course, there's no charge for that whatsoever. I have a lot of guest podcasts, which you, if you want to listen to more, you may have had enough of me today. If you want to go a little deeper, you can join a book club, uh, but you have to get a group of people. Uh, you get a workbook and six hours of video, not spelled with a W, but with a no. Uh, and you can bring a group of people together with that workbook, with that video of either re the regenerative business or the regenerative life. And if you're interested in that and putting together a group of people, it, it does require buying a hundred books. It's a deal I make with my editor, but they give you 50% off. So it's like buying 50 books. Same, same deal, except with the regenerative life, I have a project you can join. That means you would be experiencing working with these seven first principles with something called energies and energy levels and energy drains and applying them to somewhere in your life. Again, you have to buy a hundred, um, uh, no, you don't have to buy a hundred books for that project. I forgot what the number is. But if that interests you, you have a way to come back to me and not have to pay almost anything. You don't pay anything from me, you, you buy some books. All right, I'm gonna go back to Dan and find out where we are, pop back in here. And we got about 10 minutes, which I'm delighted. And I would love to hear what you're finding that's intriguing you, what you're thinking about it. People, please keep putting material in the chat room to let me know what's going on with you. That'd be really helpful. Dan? Uh, just a couple reflections. I think uh, what people are taking away as far as what they're intending to do uh, differently to the split page uh, point. Bill says, uh, spending more time observing the land I'm building the farm on. Um, Lovely. Nicholas uh, says, uh, learned how questioning what I'm truly doing in life is my best own life advice. Um, I think that may go to one of your deeper points. Um, yeah. If you want to elaborate on that. Well, that's like epistemologically. I believe when you get in a field, like we're all in here together, we're in it. And I think we succeeded a little bit in building a field, even in spite of the technology <laughs> with your help, Dan. Uh, I do believe we can access answers we didn't know we have. 
And yeah. for, for me, particularly if you have a framework, like we have a shared framework now called the seven first principles. Yeah. And we have the seven degenerative principles. Once we do that, you don't need me giving you answers. You do your own exploration. That's why that's my epistemology. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'll just add, add to that. I um, was able to talk to a, a Navajo elder earlier this week. And um, I've had a couple of conversations I've had with him now. Um, and he was using the the term uh, dream time, yeah, and defining it as you know that, as I understand it, that space where you're sort of having visions, where things are coming to you, where things you didn't know um, or, or or see before sort of pop up, and um, yeah, to to the to the point about uh, questioning what you're doing and sort of just being engaging in that process. I think. Um, yeah, I'd, 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 I'd heard the term dream time as referred to yeah. you know, Aboriginal perspectives and things like that. But um, I feel like that's what I do when I'm out on the land. And it's... Um, yeah, you're in a field literally, but also psychologically. Well, vibrationally, I'm, I think we're just, we're all this antenna system that's, you know, tuning into all the frequencies around us. And so... Yeah. Uh, you know, there is one other offer I would tell people on March 31st, Harvard School of, of Design is doing a panel which will have a Lakota um, elder who teaches at Harvard uh, and he is an amazing human being and myself. Uh, and I had to really disrupt them around how I'm willing to participate and they finally agreed. And Bill Reed, who is my colleague as well as a member of one of my communities. All right, give us some more. Uh, great. Um... Uh, Nina, Nina says, I love the word life shed and I love the idea of the indirect approach. And now I see the dangerousness of characterization. Um, uh, Ian uh, says, I, I can say I don't trust the ens essence sensing process because it is so easy for anyone to claim that they have the last or best word. Yeah. How to validate the response. I say you can't trust it on its own face. Best option is to seek convergence of several minds. Well, I just say you don't have any right to tell people what you think. I want you to learn to experience people at the level of essence. So when I'm sitting and talking with someone, instead of functionally looking at them, I say, what, what is energizing them? What are they caring about? But I don't name it. I, 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 even yeah. when I do that work for my corporations, I say, these are all candidates. They're more to give you an idea of something to work with. So I agree. But the real problem is the ego that wants to get in there and name it rather than we are designed to be able to sense and connect with others' essence. That is part of our being, but we're not taught how to develop it, how to use it and how to stay out of the way. That's my reflection. I, I would say if you yeah, the concept of this is your essence, quote unquote, is missing the point, yeah. but, but um, being present with what you're saying as the energy of where the connection is and where the vitality is, yeah. is the, is the visceral experience, which does not need to be named, but actually is, is that living interaction. Um, right. So um, uh, Lenore says the answers are within is not mystical notion. It's a human experience. Yeah. Uh, I would say, you know, just, you know, I don't know why human and mystical got separated because as far as I'm concerned, you know, the vibrational <laughs> reality of nature says that they are, I mean, there's this whole fraudulent construct of here's science over here and here's religion over there. Exactly. And people go through their lives, you know, literally believing like on Sundays or whatever, I believe my religious traditions. And then yeah. on the weekdays, I believe my, you know, Western scientific traditions and the two shall never, right. you know, twin. Fragmentation. Never meet. What was so, that? Yeah. It's, yeah, anyway, I think- All right, so Dan, let's reflect for a moment. We're just about out of time here. What's this yeah. been like for you? Um, was it what you were hoping we'd do? What's moving and shaking for you? Um, well, I, I, you know, we started this conference out with Reginaldo's presentation on, on sort of decolonizing the mind right. um, and sort of beginning to really question some of these foundational assumptions that I think you know, most people, like you said, regardless of their genetic heritage, who've been brought up in this cultural right. framework, struggle with. Um, and uh, I, I really think your your seven first principles there are a really powerful, in my mind, um, matrix to check in with and and 
um, provide context, it, I think it's, I think, I feel like we've deepened the conversation about that uh, decolonizing the mind um, and the indigenizing ourselves, however you want to frame it, whatever the proper words are. Um, so yeah, I, I, I feel like I got a lot out of it. And I, I sense from the comments here, but also I just think that the, the calibers is, um, is high. So thank you. Well, let me tell you what I get out of this. I got your resilience at discovering that I had a whole plan that we couldn't do. And it happens to me often because I really disagree with the format of talking heads and yep. one thing here, one thing, another. And I, I really appreciate your ability to step into this role. And it has been fun. I've enjoyed it a great deal. Because yeah. then I feel, I walk away nourished when I am put in a role and expect to speak to people as answers, I walk away depleted. Uh, I, right there with you. I don't yeah. do PowerPoints. I don't like doing, you know, blind webinars when I don't, don't know who's in the room. If I can't be in a room with people and feel their energy, it feels like I'm flat and dead and I leave, I leave yeah. de-energized. De so I'm, I'm right there with you and I apologize for being no, it, I, I'm <laughs> appreciating actually in some ways that it happened. Yeah. So what I want to do is thank everybody. And I would like for you and I just to stay here quietly if we could so we can have the chat room run a little longer and people keep adding and uh, otherwise just say goodbye to our conversation. Do you have anything else you want to do to close? Oop, we just lost you there. You lost me? Yeah, you said, do you have anything else? You were asking I if said, I do you have anything else you want to add? Uh, otherwise, I think we can be quiet and let people keep putting their, their reflections in the chat room. Uh, because once we shut this down, they can't keep writing. That's so I exactly thought we right. might just be silent for a I'm moment. I'm happy to be silent and say thank you. Yeah, yeah. I love people's. Thank you. Questions.